Rome. You mean Rome wasn't built in an hour? Right. <laughs> or 45 even one. Okay, so it's going to take it or what? Yeah, I got it. Huh? You got it? Okay. If it's well, rolling. just takes, can just kind of feel your ground with your feet on, oh, and feet. just pretend sure. it's earth, and it is, and it just sure. takes some deep breaths. Sure and if you want to close your eyes, and just feel your presence, grace in this room. This is at the daily word. Healing prayer. I pray a prayer of living faith and in God's perfect love, I am set free and healed. How often we have heard the words, thy faith hath made thee whole. Yet, during these times when we have had need of healing, we may have wondered how to have faith that heals and sets free. Many persons who have been healed have spoken of a peace and a release that came to them like a prelude to their healing as they prayed. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Here is the way to have faith and trust in God's healing love. We are to keep our mind stayed on God. This is real faith. This is the faith that heals. No matter what the appearance or condition, as we dwell on the truths of God's presence in the midst of us, healing us, surrounding us, filling our body with renewed life and strength, peace and release will come. And with this feeling of peace and release will come living faith, faith that restores and makes us whole. Let us make our prayers powerful and vital, prayers of living faith in God's healing love. This is James 5. The prayer of faith will save the sick. I'm just welcome, and I uh, did want. I just I've been waiting for three weeks to hear what Texas has to do with the sacred city of Rome. So I probably would have, I would have stayed, stayed home if Paul hadn't have set that that yeah, hanger good. out there for cliffhanger for us. Yeah, yeah, so, but uh, but just uh, so grateful for everybody being here and for Paul's sharing each January has just graced us with some wonderful information and, and, and just making it so enjoyable to take in and to, to remember and, and we uh, and Colin has uh, saved this on YouTube the, the audio or it's maybe yeah. well, it's a video it's too. a video yeah, yeah. both Good. Video on YouTube. but at least you can and so that's just a wonder if you missed some of the classes yeah. you can go on YouTube yeah. if you need the links let me know or email me or something yeah John's got them yeah. but also if you if you're connected to uh, this doctor over here that talks <laughs> on his on <laughs> website on 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 uh, Facebook, you'll probably see it. The links too. Yeah, great. So, what is your name? What, did you want to introduce <laughs> him? Yeah, please introduce him. Right? Oh, John Lipinski. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not speaking today. I guess that's what to do. Oh, I'm not speaking today. I guess that's what to do. No, but we're just we got kind of a break here, but. Uh, has the DVD, so if you want to check with him about <laughs> purchasing it for a small phenom or phenomenal fee. Yeah, phenomenal. Five dollars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but that'd be great. But it's just <laughs> fun. To, and it, even if you hear it, it, to me, it helps me to re rehear it and kind of get more or whatever I missed during the, while I was listening or was missing it. So, <laughs> so, but um, and I did. Oh, and I, but real quickly, next week and once a month, we're gonna. Uh, delve into the 12 powers of man by Charles Fillmore and uh, if anybody's interested and in, this is kind of a I'll just put them over here on this table but if you before you leave uh, you can pick up a copy of just kind of an introduction introduction to the faith faith is the first power and we, we're just realizing he left the women out of this in the book but uh, they were in, I'm sure they were involved in his thinking so, but Paul's just here. We're just grateful for Paul, and I want to give him just as much time as possible. So, and just uh, Paul's a 
uh, has been a professional. How many years in the Dallas area? In this Coming up on 50. Get out of here. Whoa. 50 years of teaching wonderful information. Uh, he has quite a following of, of students that, you know, just really appreciate it as, as much as we do. So thanks for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a real treat to be here and also uh, uh, a treat to uh, see so many good, dear friends again. Once a year, sometimes, some of you, is the only time I see you, it's January. So a few years ago, I started coming in May. And so I do a series in May here, and I hope in the evening, uh, three, sun, three uh, Mondays or Tuesdays or something like that in, in May. So I look for that in uh, Unity uh, newsletter. Um, I hate it that John Lipinski is gone. I always have to make fun of him for his great ties. I, uh, I attempt to uh, imitate, but um, this is my Garden of Eden tie. Uh, it's, it's okay, but it doesn't just blind you like John's does. Uh, I want to write down a word that has been very meaningful this week. Now we're speaking today about Rome, and this of course is a Latin word, inauguration. What's very interesting to me is how nobody ever asks the question, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, having with that set up, uh, we'll take it apart. In augur Asian. Now augur, or augur, augury is fortune telling. So the auger is the fortune teller. Now, so to be in means to be in tune with. There's that tie. Come on in, Sharon. We got you up here at the amen section. Okay. <laughs> if Paul spits on you, just let me know. Right, 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 right. Thank Thank you. Center, Sharon. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, so the augur was a very important person for the Romans. He was the guy that you went to to tell you if it was okay to proceed with a project. The project could be anything. It could be a, a marriage contract. It could be uh, buying some property, something. But you had to have the approval of the augur. And the, <coughs> and the augur was, would, would consult many things. One of the popular ways in which they would find out what the future was bringing was gut gazing. And so they would take an animal, always a male, and they would take the ram, typically, and put it on an altar, cut open the gut, the center part, and the guts would all fall out. And then they would study the guts. And you had people that had virtually PhDs in gut gazing, they could tell you exactly what it meant. And uh, so it is surprising to me how very, very strongly they believed in this because if that animal, uh, say, was diseased or something, then this would be a bad omen and this would mean that they should not um, proceed with the project. So you would pay the you would pay the gut gazer, uh, who was a specialist, and uh, the the auger would well, could be a gut gazer, but gut gazing was a specialty under augury. If that makes any sense. You would pay that person to tell you is it proper now to proceed with this new project. So inauguration means you have the approval of the fortune teller. <laughs> and I thought how appropriate this week. Well, we needed a, a we need a fortune teller to tell us what the, what's coming next, and uh, it's like a fog we're going into, and uh, nobody knows, including the new president. I think probably what's going to happen. So, from the standpoint of fun and entertainment and interesting, it could be. Uh, from the standpoint of scary, it also could be 600 
There were 600 marches in cities across the world yesterday. Anybody here march? Where did you march? Dallas? Yeah, Dallas. Yeah, Fort Worth had a big one. Fort Dal How big was Dallas? Is? That's over a thousand. Was it? It had to be a little bit more than that. It, it sure was seemed way more all than they there. thought it would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it went on forever. Yeah, in uh, Los Angeles, there were so many they had to break it up into three marches. You know, hundreds of thousands. Well, they said it's up to 700, 500 to 700,000 people in L.A. alone. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, that's staggering. By the way, there's never been, to my knowledge, marches against an incoming president. And in other countries. Oh, all over the world. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, why are they marching in Norway? You know? Why are they marching in hmm. India? Rome. I mean, what, what's it? Yeah, Rome and Paris and London. All of it. So, anyway, that's a fascinating thing. Um... Brother Barry here. What you need? Where is the eraser? Oh, wait, wait a minute. Oh, that was it. Your time. <laughs> 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 oh, <no. laughs> in, my, in talking about that, if one thing we can consider is next week we're talking about faith. Mm -hmm. And that'd be the. Yeah, that, they need the faith. Are you what, sure? You're yeah, go okay. <laughs> All right. So, to be. To have the blessing of. The auger and boy, oh, we got it. Yeah, he comes in. Exactly. Yeah, this is wet or dry. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it very much. I want to uh, try to collapse and compress what I have to tell you about Rome because this could carry on for a long, long time. So I have, I've come up with a technique to explain why the Romans. Uh, believe what they did about their destiny, their universe. Oh, look who's here. Come on in. Hey, Jimmy. Yeah. <clears throat> we got, we got a chair seat. here. We got one here. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sherman, oh, maybe yeah. you could yep. scoot over yeah. here. Come on in, please. Hey. Uh, hey. 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 Well, you missed my dissertation on on inauguration, so I'm going to have to do that for you later. <laughs> so, anyway. Wow, the DVD. Yeah. <laughs> or by the DVD. Anyway, one word will help us get into the whole mindset of the Romans, and that word is this. Lupercalia. Now, this was the number one most important Holy Day holiday festival for the Romans. They had many, and one of the reasons they had so many festivals and holidays is because they didn't have weekends. The Roman week was eight days, and then start over again. And so the only time you got a break was if there was a you know day off work, if there was a holy day. And uh, so their their holy days were really important. But this was number one. Now to understand the Lupercalia, you have to understand. Uh, what the word means. First of all, Luper is the wolf, and Talia is the festival. Now, this goes, of course, back to the very core and essence of the history of what Rome is all about. So let's start with two quick stories which will set the context. The first story is the story of a young girl um, who was minding her own business, not doing anything at all, and uh, walking, walking down, walking down the street, and Zeus. Oh, I'm sorry. Zeus sees Leda, and uh, Leda, probably, I'm going to say, teenage girl still, not old, very young, but. It, Extraordinarily beautiful. And of course, he has those x ray eyes, he can look out and see. And Zeus' uh, pastime, along with that of his brothers, is the raping of gorgeous young females. And uh, he would do this as often as he wants. And strangely enough, the culture didn't think this was strange because. The child that came from this, uh, let's call it an outrage, 
would be, of course, half divine. And this is why it, 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 they, shall we say, uh, allowed it to happen, because the God was number one supreme and couldn't be stopped anyway. <coughs> and his brothers, the same thing. So they were allowed just to go ahead and do what they did. And this was, uh, and so when he spied Lita, he decides to rape her. But he rapes her in the form of a swan. Now, why would he change into a swan? He would change into all kinds of animals. Uh, very popularly, uh, he would change into, for example, a bull. Uh, in fact, he raped a young princess one time by the name of Europa. And she, of course, was a very naive young girl and believed that the bull was very innocent and pure. And so she decided to ride the bull. And uh, then she, and then she got. I, I was going to say a very bad thing, so I won't say it. Uh, she, she. Uh, she got ridden. There, there you go. Remember, I didn't say it. Jimmy said it, right? So uh, she, she had then uh, children, who are the first Europeans. So all Europeans, historically, believe they go back to to Zeus and Europa. And uh, hence the name. Now, this is so important to understand the second story. So in the second story, you have this famous banquet, a wedding banquet. Now, in ancient days, weddings were not like we have a ceremony where two people come together and, and there's exchange of vows and then somebody says, I know a <coughs> man and wife, and they're supposedly married. In the ancient days, it was a wedding feast at which a contract was agreed to and signed. A contract between two families. One family agreeing to pay the other. The money was always going from the family of the female to the family of the male. In other words, the bride has to pay off to marry into the groom's family. And that, that payoff is called the dowry. D-O-W-R-Y. And the dowry is critical to understand how they look at the social con relationship created by a marriage contract. So we see this when Jesus does his first miracle. He's at a wedding feast. And the culmination of the wedding feast is a couple going off and consummating the marriage. Without the consummation, there's no marriage. Or to put it another way, in the ancient world, if you had if you had sex with anyone, you were automatically married. And uh, this is, of course, if you have sex with God, then, then you have a special, uh, you're one of the wives of Zeus. Now, not to get too carried away on this, but this particular wedding, you have a family who are uh, getting married. Uh, uh, they are royalty, and so royalty and divinity are the same thing in the ancient world. That, that's one thing you have to really understand about how the system works. That royalty and divinity uh, coexist. So royals are divine or divinely appointed or divinely sent into the world uh, to rule and uh, by the gods. And so to this wedding, the gods and goddesses were all invited and all the royal people, but there was one particular minor god who was not invited. And he was very, very angry about this. Because, as I say, the invitation is the thing. He might not have come, but to not be invited, you see, was a social faux pas. So, what happens? He decides to wreak revenge on the wedding, the party, and, and cause everything to just get uh, crazy. So he brings to the wedding a golden apple. And this golden apple has written on it, for the most beautiful. And he comes into the wedding and he, he gives 
me throwing an apple to Zeus. And Zeus looks at him and immediately understands that this is a very dangerous thing. But for whatever reason, <laughs> Zeus decides not to just do away with the golden apple, but to give it to some naive young man who has no idea about how things work in the world. And so this naive young man is named Paris. Now this is the same Paris that Paris France is named after. <coughs> and so Paris, probably about the age of 20, is very excited, very, very intense to do a good job here and to pick the most beautiful woman to have the golden apple. So he starts going around the banquet, looking at all the women, and really enjoying his job. And what, uh, uh, d during this kind of trip around, uh, the, goddess, the goddess of uh, the wife of Zeus, whose name is Hera, comes to him and said, Zeus, look, if you give me the golden apple, I'll give you all of Asia, and I'll, I'll throw in Europe. Wow. You know, it's a huge, massive chunk of the world. Just to have the golden apple, but not really so much the golden apple as to have what's written on it, to be proclaimed the most beautiful. So this is a bride. And Paris saying, you know, this is going to be wonderful. I could be, you know, a king over all this territory. But not too long after that, then Aphrodite comes to him and says, Paris, I will give you victory. And excuse me, uh, the god Athena comes to him and said, I will give you victory in battle. And Athena, of course, is the goddess of war. Now this is really valuable because this means he can conquer any place he wants. He can conquer the world if he wants to as he cannot be defeated. And uh, remember that little detail later uh, when we, we talk about our, our, our good friend Alexander the Great. Now, the next thing that happens is Aphrodite comes to Paris and says, if you give me the golden apple, I'll give you the most beautiful woman in the entire world. Now it turns out the most beautiful world woman in the entire world is this child of Zeus and Hel of, of Lena named Helen. And of course, now we, we, we come to Helen of Troy. So, after, uh, uh, Paris gives the golden apple to Aphrodite. <coughs> she causes Helen to fall in love with Paris. And then the two of them run off to Troy, where Paris is one of the 50 sons of Priam, the king. All right, now you have the setup. So in Troy, you pretty well know how this story goes. They fight for 10 years, uh, and this is back and forth, back and forth. And, the, and the, none of the gods uh, can really decide, including Zeus, who should win. So they just let them go back and forth. And one of the reasons is because in, in this, uh, in, inside of Troy, they have the Palladium. Now, the Palladium comes from the word palace. <clears throat> and so this is the statue or the, uh, the image of, of Athena. Because it's, it's Athena, this is one of her alternate names. So they have her statue. And as long as the Trojans are worshiping that statue, Athena cannot let the Greeks defeat destroy Troy. Even though she hates Troy. Why does she hate Troy? Because Paris gave the golden apple to Aphrodite instead of her. So she is in a great quandary. 
So eventually what happened, of course, is one particular Greek sneaks inside Troy, steals the Palladium. His name is Odysseus. And when, when he's done that, he, he leaves and he, he comes, uh, he leaves up, <coughs> steals the Palladium, and then leaves with the Greeks who pretend that they're defeated and go off. And then you know the story of the Trojan horse. The reason the Trojan horse is successful is because the Palladium is gone from Troy. So Palladium with a small p today means anything that you might have that's going to protect you. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, all the Catholics said there's St. Christopher, a little statue on the, the front. Did, did you all have one? Did you? Did, did you the the St. Christopher. And that would protect them on their journeys. So it is very, very important to appreciate and understand that palladium it is uh, a deep, very deep concept for the for these folks. Now, uh, by the way, Athens had a very huge palladium, and it protected Athens all those years, of course, until the Spartans came and destroyed it. Now, let's go back, let's get rid of this, and let's go back now to the story and get to the Lupercalia. So, Troy, Troy is completely destroyed. Probably if you go visit Troy, you'll see that Troy was destroyed about 18 times. So, they've always had a lot of trouble trying to guess for sure which one of those destructions was the Trojan War. But there was a young man who, a royalty of, of Troy, who was not in Troy when it was destroyed. He was on patrol. His name was Aeneas. And so Aeneas, Aeneas escapes with some of his men. And then he goes on a, a ten-year journey uh, to find a new place to establish Troy. Finally, he does at the end of 10 years. And uh, Aeneas, of course, this story is um, told in the Aeneid by Virgil. If the Romans ever had a Bible, you'd see Aeneid. So the Aeneid story of how he eventually gets to Italy. And there he sets up a kingdom, a great difficulty because there are many other tribes and people that want this area. He calls it Latinium, from which we get the word Latin. Now, uh, eventually, of course, um, Aeneas passes away, and then his son takes over and struggles and tries to keep it together. And then he has two ch t uh, twin sons, who you, I'm sure, have heard of, Romulus and Remus. Now, Romulus and Remus uh, are a great threat to these other people that want to have this land called Lepinium. <coughs> and so they are constantly, people are constantly trying to get a hold of them. Uh, their enemies, and eventually somebody does, and they want, they get ready to execute two little babies, but they can't do it. So they decide on plan B. Plan B is put them in a basket, let them float down the flooded Tiber River out into the Mediterranean, and say to die. So there they are coming down the stream very fast, and there's a big turn in the Tiber. They come around, whip around, but because the Tiber is way up high, part of the Tiber is in the trees, and they get caught in the branch. And when they get caught in this branch, they're crying and screaming. A she-wolf, remember? Looper means wolf. The she-wolf hears them, and comes out on the branch, and, and just comes right over where their basket is, gets down to where they can suckle from the sheba. And this continues for a day or two when a shepherd comes by. 
and sees them and saves them, takes them.